Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome along to the nearly 2,000 registrations we've actually got for, for tonight, uh, participants for, for this evening's webcast, but also to those who are reviewing or, or viewing this later as a, as a podcast. Uh, MHPN wishes to commence tonight by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands across Australia on which our participants and also our speakers have, uh, have gathered and come and live and learn. Uh, we wish to pay our respects to those elders past, present and uh, emerging for the future, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of the, uh, the, the land that we, we share in Indigenous Australia. My name is Conrad Kungru. I'm a GP in Proserpine in, in North Queensland, uh, GP supervisor and uh, been participant in these MHPN webinars for a few years now. And uh, so I'll be a facilitator for tonight's session. I'm um, you know, not, a, not an expert in any of these areas as for any of us, but hoping that we're all going to be able to come to, together and, and learn a lot from this fantastic panel who we've got. So uh, hopefully you've all had a, a chance to, to read up on uh, the, the case study tonight and I'm just going to take you through to, to introduce each of the, uh, the wonderful panellists who we've, we've got. I'm going to start off with introducing Professor Dimity Pond. Um, Dimity is the Professor of General Practice at the University of Newcastle. But she's also been a GP in clinical practice since 1984. Uh, of that time, she spent about 20 years working on research in the area of, of dementia, mainly on how to streamline the, the GP approach to what is uh, often for many of us a very difficult but still increasingly common problem. Um, Dimity is currently working on GP consensus guidelines for, for common general practice aspects of dementia identification and care. Welcome, Dimity. I, wonder, I understand that you know, you're working on these consensus guidelines. Um, when are these going to be available to GPs? Thank you, Conrad. Uh, yes, um, I'm working with the Cognitive Decline Partnership Centre. The project finishes at the end of June and uh, then it, the new guidelines, the GP guidelines, have to go through a, an authorisation process. So I'd say uh, in the middle of the second, around September or something like that, they'll appear on the CDPC website, the Cognitive Decline Partnership. We'll be keeping an eye out for them. Thanks, Dimity. Uh, now wel welcome Alison Argo. Alison is a clinical psychologist who specialises in gerontology. She's been uh, involved in research for people with Parkinson's disease, but currently she's working with Queensland Health primarily focusing on cognitive assessment for differential, differential diagnoses of, of dementia, older persons' mental health and also care education support. Alison has worked across various settings including in re, re, uh, regional and, and remote, as well as being involved in acute inpatient and community settings. For several years she's also been uh, doing lecturing in a dementia specific course for, for TAFE uh, students uh, out here in, in rural North Queensland. Alison's a long-standing member of the steering committee of the Queensland Statewide Dementia Clinical Network and the part, part of what they are involved in is informing government policy, ensuring consistency of, of, uh, of the treatment available for patients across the, the state, disseminating uh, dementia research and, and initiatives, but also as all of us are involved with advocating for people with dementia, their, dementia, their family and their carers. Alison, welcome. What do you find rewarding about working with carers of people with dementia? Uh, I, I'm sure everybody um, will agree with me. Um, it's that they're very vulnerable people and I, I do find it very rewarding um, because often we can actually put in um, a very small amount of time can create um, some really um, great and lasting rewards. So, um, you know, a session or two sessions um, providing some validation and a quick bit of education um, or fine tuning of what they're already doing well um, and you can see um, a reduction in their stress and their worry that then reflects in their health and, and their own demeanour and then that directly um, impacts and, and positively influences how they can um, then um, look after their loved one uh, uh, and, and <coughs> carer and then that um, positively impacts on the person with dementia. So um, it truly is um, re very rewarding um, and yeah, getting some of those positive outcomes, there's, there's nothing like it. It's great. Thanks, Alison. Yeah. Now I'm going to introduce Alyssa Westfall. Uh, Alyssa is a registered occupational therapist with, she's got extensive experience in aged mental health 
but also a special interest in utilising non-pharmacological approaches to more effectively in, enable, engage and care for those with, with dementia. Welcome uh, Alyssa. What is something you tend to always keep in mind when you're working with carers? Thanks Conrad. Look, I'm always conscious of engaging the carers as the experts. They know themselves best and they have the longitudinal history with the person with dementia. Um, so look, they're just so pivotal in um, the relationships that you're able to form and also uh, the progress that you're able to make in helping them. Thanks Alyssa, that's great. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Professor Stephen McFarlane. Stephen is Head of the Clinical Service for the Dementia Centre of Hammond Care. He's been very active in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials uh, since the late 90s and has actually been involved in setting up his own clinical trial centre based at Caulfield Hospital. Uh, Stephen's clinical interests in, include frontal lobe disorders and senile squalor. Stephen, you've uh, worked for De Dementia Support Australia as the, their Head of Clinical Services. Does Dementia Support Australia have any role to play in supporting carers of people with dementia? Absolutely. I mean, Dementia Support Australia is a, an umbrella organisation for two programs. There's the Severe Behaviour Response Team and the National DB Mass Program, Dementia Behaviour Management Advisory Service. SBRT only goes into uh, Commonwealth funded aged care facilities, so in that sense we, we support paid professional carers. But DB Mass has a community focus as well and maybe about 25% of the referrals to DB Mass are for people living with dementia at home with family carers so we help them manage behavioural problems that might arise during the course of the illness and provide strategies to decrease the carer burden and improve the quality of life for the person living with dementia. Thanks. Fantastic Stephen, thanks so much. So to everybody who's been part of an MHPN uh, webinar in, in the past, you probably noticed that it's a different format, that we've moved on to a, a new platform and really that's, uh, that's come about through the immense popularity of these workshops. Tonight we're already up to about sort of 600 participants I think by the look of it. We might be expecting a few more and we actually just outgrew our previous platform. So I hope you all enjoy the interactivity of the, the new format or it might take a little while to, to get used to. Um, now what, but still that nonetheless there's still a lot of the same principles that, that apply. Uh, to access the chat box so you can all engage in the, the participation, open the open chat box uh, tab at the bottom of, of the screen and then that will open up into a new tab for you. There'll be a resource library tab also at the bottom of the screen there where you'll be able to find links to supporting resources which we may have. And of course we've got the technical support uh, FAQs tab up the, the top there uh, which you can access to have uh, advice with any of your technical issues. We've also got the, uh, the free toll number there to, to call if you are still having difficulties. Um, but yeah, please do make sure that you do give us your, your feedback on, on the experience and that there's uh, also going to be some comments about this new platform in the exit webinar which we'll encourage you all to complete at the end of the end of the session. I'm going to move on now just to those old familiar ground rules that we, we want everybody to, uh, to remember and just to make sure that everybody gets the maximum benefit out of tonight, please make sure that you remain respectful of other participants and, and panellists. Even though we're in a virtual space, we're all sort of sharing the same discussion and conversation, so just behave as you would if we were all face to face. Uh, as I said, please do feel free to, to use the participant chat box, um, but try just to make sure that you're keeping your comments on topic. There's a lot of comments that, that come through very rapidly, so if, if they are succinct, we're going to be more able to actually keep up with them. Uh, now, as I said, there's the, uh, the, the FAQ tab for the technical support. But if you can't get anywhere with that, feel free to, to call Red, Redback Help on 1800 291 863. And, uh, but if there is something which is actually happening across the, the platform, we'll, uh, we'll alert you with an announcement about that. And as I said, once again, please make sure that you do complete the webinar at the, at the end before you log off. Now, we've uh, hopefully all had a chance to read through the, the case study about Maureen, so I'm not going to be going through that uh, in any depth now, but we are just going to revisit the learning objectives for, for tonight. So we're hoping that by exploring dementia in, in this fashion, we're going to give you the chance to identify some challenges, tips and strategies for building appropriate referral pathways, and how to implement a collaborative response that might best assist families caring for people living with dementia. We're hoping you'll feel able to implement key principles of providing appropriate therapies and communication approaches for those families who need to engage with uh, their, their family member who is experiencing dementia to maximise their support. 
We also want to make sure that everybody is able to describe the general principles of providing a safe and supportive environment for families that are providing care for people living with dementia, including self-care. And of course we do have to remember that dementia in and of itself is a massive topic and there's no way we can actually cover all of that. So a reminder that tonight's webinar is not actually about dementia as, as a clinical site, it's about be how we can best support the carers of those supporting somebody with dementia. So on that, I think it's time for us to, to move on. And uh, Dimni, we're, we're talking about Maureen as the, as the carer for, for Malcolm and uh, we're anticipating that Maureen might be your patient. So let's see what your perspectives are if, if, uh, if Maureen comes along to see you. Thanks. So uh, basically uh, uh, Maureen's going to present to us at the end of that scenario, going to present to a GP with a uh, this stress and depression that she's got in relation uh, to looking after her father, Malcolm. So uh, depression is really common in people with dementia and, uh, sorry, in people who are caring for someone with dementia and I've got uh, details there on the slide about it being up to 30% and other stress related psychiatric disorders like anxiety, um, a little bit further down, fear for the future insomnia, all sorts of physical symptoms, reduced quality of life, uh, lack of time for themselves and their own social life, um, feeling they've lost control because they never know what's going to happen next. Some days dad might be good and other days not so good. Uh, and practical hardships, uh, Maureen's considering having to give up work and that will reduce her income. So it's a problem. So. Uh, Someone like that, uh, so are you going to move the slides on or I do that? Uh, you'll find it. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, here we are. So if we look at uh, we look at this pie chart, you can see that more than 50% of carers say that caring has negatively affected their mental health. But there's still a significant number who aren't worried by it or don't report that they are. And there's even some people, and a reasonable chunk of people, about 20%, who say that they actually benefit from caring. Now if we want to assess someone as a GP, there are scales, like there are for depression that we're so familiar with, the K10, we're doing a mental health plan or something like that. Uh, so there's a caregiver burden scale, the reference for that's uh, in the next few slides and you'll have it on your handout. Uh, and those are the questions, I'm not going to read them all. Uh, but they're very uh, useful questions because they're on a scale and yet they get at these deep issues that carers have, uh, such as feeling angry, which uh, is, is easier to ask when it's part of a questionnaire rather than as a sort of confronting question for the GP asking the person. It's also possible that you could get your practice nurse to uh, go through this with a carer. Uh, so the reference for it's there. There's lots of carer scales. So if I'm assessing someone like Maureen, I'd be looking at depression, anxiety, insomnia, financial stress, all the things that we've just talked about. Uh, and then I'd start moving into how is she looking after herself? What's her social life like? How's the family relationships? They're often quite stressed when someone's uh, a carer. Diff different people in the family have different views. Self-care strategies, uh, and I've listed some of them there. GPs are very, very familiar with self-care strategies and very good at suggesting them. And then uh, what do they need? Well, at the top I've put education, but in actual fact, I think on reflection that carers need to be listened to, first of all, and validated, that their feelings are normal and expected. Uh, when they're in that stressful role. Then sure, education about dementia as appropriate for the carer and for their situation. <coughs> Practical strategies, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, assessment and management of their physical and emotional problems. They may actually have uh, physical problems to do with uh, the physical task of caring, lifting and uh, all the extra work. Assistance with respite, there are respite, uh, there's respite available through My Aged Care, um, 
and uh, you can get people to come and sit with your person you're caring for while you go shopping, something like that. Planning the move to residential aged care and then uh, looking at sources of support. Uh, uh, and uh, just I should mention two uh, excellent ones which are uh, Alzheimer's Australia which um, offers a helpline so people can ring. People can always also ring GBMAS, which uh, was mentioned earlier. And uh, Alzheimer's Australia also has some excellent help sheets. And then finally, uh, and last but not least, uh, psychological approaches. So uh, we've got uh, cognitive behavioural therapy having been tested and proved to help carers by reducing that burden of care on a scale like that Sarah burden scale I showed you. It delays institutionalisation, it improves survival, uh, that's for the person with dementia, uh, and, but carers also have a mortality and morbidity rate and it improves the carer's skills in managing uh, patient behavioural problems. That's it from me. Wonderful, thanks, Divini. So it's it's great to to get that that uh, that coordinating approach from from the start. And you'll, we've just touched there on some of the uh, some of the therapeutic things that that might be of, of assistance. Alison, we might move on now to to you there on on what other therapeutic uh, approaches you think are appropriate for a lady with Maureen caring for somebody like Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Conrad. That was a lovely lead in from Dimity into um, the psychological um, perspective on how we go about helping a carer. My slides are quite busy so I'm actually not going to cover them all. I just wanted to have the information there for you. Um, but you would have seen um, from Maureen's case um, she's got a lot of the classic symptoms of carer burnout. Um, so the, the red flags are there and the impact um, is actually quite serious. So there's a lot of research um, that uh, reports um, serious um, implications for the carer's health, physical health, emotional, mental health, um, her social relationships, her work is at risk. Um, so I want to get into uh, the types of treatments that we would do. Um, and first and foremost, I want to just highlight there in bold, you can see that the, the treatment um, targets that are required, particularly when a carer is in, in quite severe burnout, it's usually because there's a lack of support. Um, so we usually have to do multiple things at, at once for them and um, we have to magically do that <laughs> without actually adding to their burden. So we can't have our own intervention be, be another burden um, for them. And the types of things that we need to do simultaneously are the practical supports themselves. There's no point in providing emotional or psychological support um, if you're not actually changing the environment for them. If they're, if they're overtired and, and they're not getting any help, um, their exhaustion isn't going to go away with, without the actual practical help. So that is all the pathways that um, Dimity's already mentioned, um, but I will cover them uh, briefly in a minute. Uh, Education on self-care is, is essential and um, I'll cover that in a slide. Um, actual therapeutic input um, to help them address the emotional um, things that are going on for them um, and, and then specifically um, education on dementia management. So trying to do all of that at once and not burden them is, is um, a, a real challenge. Um, so with self-care, um, for most of you out there, um, you're also in a caring role, so the same um, principles of self-care apply to us all. Sorry, I just clicked on that by mistake. Um, so the the point that I'd like to make here is is one that actually is 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 very inherent in our society, um, and particularly so for women, but not just for women, is the concept of putting self last because heaven forbid if we put self first, that therefore makes us selfish and that's a bad thing, it's a wrong thing. So the first thing I have to do is, um, is make check in with someone and, and make sure that they understand that that concept of self last is, is a very dangerous um, thing and we need to shift that. 
because if they're not looking after themselves first, obviously they crumble and then we've got no one to look after the person with dementia. So um, that, that whole um, uh, logic needs to be shifted. Um, and then there's lots of, uh, again, Dimity's already mentioned, lots of um, literature and, and lots of classic techniques on, on how we look after ourselves and, and find that balance. Um, they do need to understand um, the literal and physical limitations on, on one person alone caring for someone with dementia. Um, I find validation is, is probably the key. Um, and if we do nothing but validate their experience and, and um, often um, confirm for them um, when they haven't had a diagnosis what's going on, it can, it can do amazing things for them alone. Okay, so self-cares um, definitely need to be highlighted. Um, I actually think I skipped a slide, so I'll just go back to the practical support. Um, uh, it's a national system now through My Age Care and um, the ACAD or the ACAS teams. Um, I just wanted to uh, highlight there that um, the issue of decision making and who, who is making decisions um, is a big one that comes up um, extremely regularly um, in people with dementia as their cognition fails. Uh, and so and often it comes up because we're needing to put those supports in. Um, if the person with dementia lacks insight, which actually happens to be one of the most common symptoms, um, people think it's memory loss, but it's actually that loss of insight that's very common, for example, in, in dementias like Alzheimer's disease, then the person themselves thinks they're fine and that they don't need support. And that's where you find the, the carer burden and the carer burnout is often quite high because we come along and find that the person with dementia is still calling the shots and saying, I don't need any help. In the case of Maureen here, um, Malcolm is actually saying he doesn't want any other help, he only wants Maureen. Um, so, and that's quite a common scenario. Um, so establishing who is the decision maker is um, another very important thing to do um, and it's, it's very complex. We certainly won't be able to cover too much of it <laughs> um, tonight, but we can we can brush on it in question time. Um, so self cares are important. I've just got a slide there on the emotional processing, so that would be um, more specifically some psychological um, interventions, CBT and, and therapeutic input with the carer. Um, importantly, there I've just got gently, gently. If you've got someone who's very exhausted in front of you the chances that they're going to take in much uh, are very slim. So you've, you've got to um, understand that cognitively they're not taking in much because they're very exhausted and they'll tell you so as well which, which makes things a bit easier. But the, the themes that we do find that do need to be addressed, um, often I find we have to put the practical supports in first, get them some sleep. Um, some validation, they're feeling better, and then you can actually start working on some of these really deep-seated emotional um, things that they have to process, grief and loss um, being a main one, and also guilt as a carer comes up um, consistently. Um, on the right-hand side, I've actually just got um, some quick points on delivering um, the dementia education. Um, so. The way that works is that if we can tweak and fine tune what the carer is already doing, um, that then um, improves um, the situation for both the carer and the person with dementia. Uh, so there's some classic techniques I've got listed there, task breakdown. Um, the main one I would like to highlight is the non-verbal communication. Um, so when the language is failing, uh, non-verbal communication is very important. Um, and also fine-tuning the techniques. Um, we need to personalise them for the person with dementia. And the, t uh, the right um, type of person to do that um, are our occupational therapists um, who can actually really personalise and fine 
tune to um, for the person with dementia which, and, and for the carer. So on that note, I will finish up. Thanks, Alison. And uh, there's, there's no question at all that being able to properly individualise the approach for the, for the care of somebody with dementia really is so important. So uh, yeah, Alyssa, we'd love to hear what, where the occupational therapist role would, would fit for this area. Great. Thanks, Alison and Conrad. So as an OT, as Conrad and Alison have said, it's very much the role is individualised to suit the needs and abilities um, of the carer and the person with dementia. Generally start by identifying the carer's issues, priorities, strengths and abilities. Um, it just helps guide the OT in using an, an enabling strengths-based approach that utilises and best meets the carer's needs. Exploring the carer role, self-care and their readiness to change informs the therapist about the meaning this role brings, their past successes and difficulties, how they de-stress and their willingness to change or try strategies. Um, for Maureen and for many others, I might actually explore the possibility of engaging family, friends or community members and may use a more shared approach um, with, with the family for Maureen. Uh, talked a bit about communication, um, a mismatch in the communication and approach styles with the abilities, needs and preferences of the person with dementia can be a good trigger for responsive behaviours and it may be that and um, non-success in terms of uh, visiting her dad might be because of the communication and approach styles that she's actually using. So simple changes such as being less demanding, validating his feelings, simplifying the language use, avoiding arguing and reminiscing about pleasant topics may actually help. If the frequent calls are identified by Maureen as an issue, it may be useful to explore the timing, duration, reason for the calls and what assists in resolving those so that that information can be used. Okay, moving on to focusing a bit on Malcolm because it's difficult to only focus on the carer because the carer is really experiencing a great deal of issues because of the care being provided and the relationship there. So for Malcolm, if there are functional causes for his incontinence, they're always worth considering and exploring. So task breakdown can be quite useful in identifying the steps that he's actually struggling with. Um, for example, if Mal Malcolm has visual perceptual difficulties that make it difficult for him to perceive the toilet in space, I might actually suggest changing to a higher contrast toilet seat. Disengagement from meaningful activities is a common occurrence during the dementia trajectory. Um, and it can contribute to anxiety, depression, agitation. Uh, engagement provides a sense of structure, purpose, identity and meaning and as such for the person with dementia is something that we really shouldn't overlook. Um, the environment too is a powerful dictator of behaviour and particularly for those with dementia. So we might look at these by exploring Malcolm's interests, his abilities, strengths, his time use, the opportunities available for engagement and how the environment enables and disables him. These all help providing vital clues that facilitate strategies being developed that maximise his engagement and functioning. Finally, in terms of assessment, um, it's really important to consider any sort of risk and safety issues that may be present. Okay, moving on to some intervention focused things. Um, for carers like Maureen, it's always worth trialling, considering trialling strategies that have a high chance of success first and that also utilise her strengths. There are a number of additional strategies in the arrow bar on the, the slide that you have and you've also heard strategies from both um, Alison and Dimity. Modifying expectations and the way tasks are done may assist in reducing carer's stress. So for instance, for Maureen, we could explore online grocery shopping or cooking in batches. A shared schedule might be used to allocate responsibilities to different people and share the caring load. Um, having it online for many people these days is a useful way of tracking who is doing what when and allows for that instant sharing of information. For Maureen and for many other carers, having periods scheduled for relaxation and physical activity, so low activity and high activity times, um, can provide that opportunity to um, engage in more self-care behaviours. Physical activity may also help um, not just Maureen but also Malcolm. 
Um, and sometimes aromatherapy is something that's quite useful to try with the person with dementia, particularly if there's an agitated base. Dimity talked about support. Um, and so I'm not going to go into that other than to say that you're often looking at increasing or getting what support is available that you can. Okay. Finally, engagement. For those with dementia, it can be necessary, particularly as things progress for carers to direct or encourage engagement. Engagement strategies should utilise the person's abilities and skillfully compensate for any deficits. They should be structured to provide routine and to prompt engagement. And for Malcolm, a daily schedule with what he needs to do, what is available to do or ideas of things to do may actually assist. And it may provide the carers with something concrete that they can refer to and prompt the person when needed. Um, activities that are familiar and achievable are vital in facilitating an enabling approach. Uh, but often what we need to do is actually modify or simplify the activities. Um, repeated one to two step activities draw on a strength that many of those with dementia retain for some time. So they're useful to look at. And having task related items clustered together is another, another useful task simplification technique. So some activity stations comprising activities with repeated steps could be set out in his environment. An example is given on the slide there of the laundry with the folding activity and placing a sign that invites engagement and directs it can be quite helpful. Again, we look at pacing low activities with high activity times to provide opportunities for both exertion and also rest and recovery. And as a dementia progresses, often the person needs more of that time for the rest and recovery compared to the high activity time. Um, technology is increasingly receiving attention for its capacity to automate some care activities, manage risk issues and facilitate engagement. And that, there are some things that may be useful for Malcolm in that as well. Finally, the environment. There are a range of recommendations and principles when it comes to modifying the environment to be more enabling. Many are inexpensive and free or free and easy to do and I'd encourage you to check out the enablingenvironment.com.au website as a starting, point, starting place. Thank you. Alyssa, that's, uh, that, that's, that's fantastic and, and thank you very much for all of those insights. Stephen, of course, we've, we've just heard from, um, from Maureen's uh, GP and the wonderful allied health professionals who've been involved also with uh, looking at how we might be best caring for, for Malcolm. What would be your psychiatrist's perspective to, to share uh, on, on this so far? I'd be trying to identify clinical issues that I'd have the capacity to influence and the case study, the way it's presented, gives us a number of clues or opportunities to intervene to help both Maureen and Malcolm. We're told, for example, that he has a dementia that's likely of mild to moderate severity. It's <coughs> excuse me, mild according to his MMSC at 23, but probably better called moderate with a mocker of 18. His presenting behaviour of concern, if you like, is identified as anxiety which manifests by him frequently ringing Maureen throughout the day. My clinical hypothesis there would be that the anxiety is contingent upon his cognition. In other words, with a mini mental around that level and left at home to his own devices during the day, he finds it difficult to struggle, uh, to orient himself to reality and to what, should, what he should be doing at any particular time of day. So the phone calls to Maureen serve to prompt him uh, and reorient him as to what he should be doing, uh, reorient him to time and place and person perhaps. So if we could improve his cognition, potentially, the anxiety may well be uh, dragged along in the wake of that. So that's a clinical hypothesis that I would have in regards to Malcolm. Uh, Maureen obviously has her own issues. The uh, likelihood of carer burnout has been raised by the previous speakers. We learned from the case history that she's spending 25, 25 minutes each way driving every day to see her father. She's spending up to four hours each day on the weekend to support him, <coughs> which is a significant time commitment for her. She has her own complex family needs. We hear that her husband's working up to 60 hours per week She's unsure of uh, his availability to support her in her care for Malcolm. We hear that she has a uh, son, age 29, who's still at home because of learning difficulties. There's family conflict regarding uh, the ideal care environment for Malcolm with the siblings. 
who feel that strongly that he should remain at home. Uh, Malcolm himself has rejected help from the other siblings, so that avenue of uh, assistance to Maureen seems uh, blocked off. Maureen herself seems likely to be depressed from some of the symptoms that are described. She's struggling to sleep, she's lost interest, she's getting snappy with her husband. I'd be uh, looking to assess her for a clinical depression at which level we might be able to intervene as well. So she's stuck in a position where she has to meet the needs of her father who's ailing. She has to meet her own needs in terms of health and recreation and time off and she has to meet the needs of her family who remain at home. Now although we're looking at uh, a webinar that's talking to supporting people who care for uh, people with dementia, really you can intervene at any number of levels in order to ease the carer burden. If we can, for example, improve certain issues in relation to, to Malcolm, I'm thinking about the anxiety cognition link, I'm also thinking about the incontinence that's been recently developed, then improvements in those symptoms for him will help Maureen. We can also target uh, interventions towards Maureen herself, assessing and treating uh, possible depression, for example, and if she's depressed and caring, she will struggle more and burn out more quickly than she would if she were not clinically depressed. So there's direct interventions for the carer, and then there's systemic interventions, things that we can do in terms of the provision of external supports that might ease the direct carer burden that Maureen herself has. So the clinical approach I'd take to this, I think I'd actually uh, like to see Malcolm and see him in the rooms, uh, certainly explore that uh, link between anxiety and cognition. I'd be asking the question if he has Alzheimer's disease, with the cognition at that level, whether he in fact has had access to a, a cholinesterase inhibitor or a cognitive enhancer at any point. And if we can improve his cognition in that way, he'll uh, be less anxious and have less reason to uh, stress more in throughout the day. The continence is a big potential problem and uh, the emergence of continence issues is often the straw that breaks the camel's back between someone being able to remain supported at home and the need for residential care. So I'd advise uh, as a first step that uh, we send him to the GP for a urinary tract checkup, uh, uh, urinary continence nurses or continence clinics or indeed a, a continence specialist in the form of a urologist could be invoked to help assess Malcolm for that particular issue. I'd be looking at his medications to see if he's on anything that might be making him more likely to be incontinent. I'd be medically reviewing Maureen as a separate issue. As I say, I'd like to see whether she has an under, any underlying depression that might benefit from treatment, either through pharmacological or non-pharmacological means, as uh, a psychologist has mentioned earlier, uh, was mentioned as an independent issue that may or may not be related to her depression, that she's struggling to sleep as well. So if she has a, a separate sleep disorder or a sleep disturbance as part of her depression, if we can fix that, uh, she's going to be able to cope with whatever uh, demands life throws at her during her waking day. I'd be particularly keen to ask Maureen the question, you know, if you could change one thing about your situation at the moment, what would you wish for? Uh, to, to get her sense of priorities about what would help her the most, it's a very useful question to ask. We can look at providing an increase in systemic supports. We hear that at the moment he's got some limited supports going into his own home but a referral through the My Aged Care portal may well uh, qualify him for a, an increased package of care or indeed approval for respite, uh, which in itself should help ease Maureen's carer burden. I'd be wanting to encourage Maureen to explore her husband's willingness and capacity to assist with care. The, the case study as it's written leaves it somewhat ambiguous whether he has either the capacity or the willingness to help. Uh, Maureen seems unsure whether he has the willingness. Uh, he should be asked to see what he can uh, bring to, to bear to aid Maureen in, in her difficulties. There's also external assistance that might be provided in the form of uh, increased financial support. One of Maureen's stresses is she feels torn between having to earn an income to support her family uh, and to uh, cut down her work on the other hand to support her father. So uh, obtaining some financial advice around that the Department of Human Services has a free financial information service uh, and she may, from the information be pro that's provided in the case study, also be eligible to receive a separate 
carer allowance. So uh, assessments at the level of the patient, at the level of the carer themselves, and seeing what systemic supports we can bring to bear, Conrad. Fantastic, Steve. Thanks so very much for uh, for that, that that wonderful perspective, and for everybody for those great insights that uh, that we've all taken so much out of. Thank you also so much to the uh, to the the to the participants as well. We've already got a, a number of great questions which have been coming through and, and points of discussion, also together with those which many of you took the time to submit prior to the webinar as well. So we're going to move through a, a few of these. Dimmy, I might just move first to, to one uh, here, seeing that a lot of the participants have, have been asking about helping patients and their carers to access um, support services that, that might be available. Uh, do you see that there's any role for the general practitioner in, in facilitating this? Uh, yes, I think there is. Um, uh, I think it's actually vital for the GP to to do that because of the flow on effects uh, for the relationship and for both uh, the carer and the person living with dementia. So um, there's various ways we can do it. Uh, I mentioned uh, telephone support lines, uh, and Stephen mentioned the DB mass that you can ring up, uh, and also Alzheimer's Australia. Uh, and there might be local carers groups in our community health centre. We have a, a carer support group once a month. So it's worth asking a practice nurse perhaps to explore what's available. But the other things are, are more the things we're accustomed to. Um, if the carer is your patient, which isn't always the case, uh, you may, and they appear to be depressed, uh, then a mental health plan is completely appropriate and they can be referred then to a psychologist for all of the good things we heard about uh, that can be done in that way. Um, it might also be that the person living with dementia, dementia is counted as a chronic disease. So it can do a chronic disease management plan and team care arrangement. And uh, you might, if there's an OT available, you're a little bit uh, thin on the ground, but if there's an OT available that can assess that person uh, from their dementia point of view, uh, and uh, suggest some strategies for uh, improving things at home, then that can be part of a, a, a chronic disease management plan and uh, team care arrangement. So uh, those are the things we're familiar with. And of course we can refer uh, both of them off to a psychiatrist uh, uh, or a geriatrician uh, if uh, that seems appropriate. Thanks, Dimity. We've, um, we've certainly heard from some of the, the practical considerations in, in planning for and the need for, for planning for future treatment for a patient like Malcolm. Alison, how would you suggest that, especially when you've got um, a family of the, of the patient with dementia who might not be accepting of the diagnosis or may have some degree of conflict amongst themselves, how do you would, would be a, a, a wise plan for how they might um, proceed when it, it, it seems to be conflict between the wishes of the patient with dementia and their carer. And uh, Megan and Peter have certainly noticed the, the questions you've been raising about EPOAs here. Sure. Um, it is a, an area that um, uh, to do with decision making capacity um, that often um, raises a lot of questions. You did mention there though, Conrad, about um, the family perhaps not accepting the diagnosis. So that also needs to occur um, during that diagnostic process, the, the family um, does require a lot of support and education around that, um, sort of uh, education um, on the facts as, as well as emotional support. But um, I suspect, yeah, a lot of the questions about um, what do we do when the person with dementia has different ideas or is not accepting of support. So in, in our current example, it's probably a great one to use with Malcolm. Um, by the sounds of it, refusing to get any help except from Maureen, like his favoured daughter. So Anne's on the outer <laughs> um, and possibly the son's too busy or... So Malcolm at the moment's um, sort of calling the shots, if you like. Um, the, the most useful approach um, is assisted decision making um, where we're actually... It's a balancing act between uh, respecting and honouring the person themselves and their personality and their history, um, the person with dementia that is. So we're, we're trying to uphold their autonomy and independence. Um, 
where possible versus we're trying to mitigate, mitigate risks. So in this example it would be um, the risk is Malcolm actually continuing to refuse supports including respite means that Maureen is going to get uh, more and more exhausted. Um, she, you know, her ability to cope um, pretty much ends and um, unfortunately Malcolm ends up needing to go into permanent placement a lot sooner than he would need to. Um, that's a great risk and it's obviously not serving in his best interest. So these type of triggers um, and these risks um, come up. Um, so when we do assisted decision making we try where we can to, to do all forms of negotiation and education and compromise um, where we don't have to do anything formal. So we could um, perhaps educate, in this example we Maybe it's Anne needs educating in, in how to um, deal with her dad. Um, maybe it's negotiating and compromising with dad or just trialling things um, and seeing how it goes. Um, but if all of that fails, we often um, uh, end up having to establish who is the decision maker. Um, and that's where people have a lot of questions. It is quite a complex um, process that needs to be done um, usually by specialist doctors um, or by geropsychs like myself. Um, and when we establish um, if Malcolm is lacking capacity, that's when we need to put in um, alternate decision makers. So if Maureen or the kids, for example, um, if Malcolm has made an enduring power of attorney, then that enduring power of attorney comes into play um, and they can make decisions in Malcolm's best interest or they'd make the decisions that Malcolm could still make, um, would, would make if he still could. Um, if there is no enduring power of attorney in place, that's when you hear about the cases where we have to go to um, the um, civil and administrative tribunals of each state. So here in Queensland ours is called the QCAF um, and they actually satisfy themselves that um, Malcolm lacks decision making capacity and then they appoint the appropriate people which is obviously usually spouses, um, family, etc. So that's how we get around it. We try and do it informally and make it all happen um, and, and then if we can't do it informally and the risks are too great then we have to formalise it in some way. Sorry, that was long, wasn't it? That's fantastic, <laughs> Alison. And I, and I think that that's really uh, answered a lot of the questions which are a lot of our, our participants have, have been um, posing. So thank you so much for, for that one. Uh, Alyssa, I, I'm, I'm seeing time and time again on these uh, on the, these chat questions, comments about how do I access an OT and how do I actually get uh, get in there? And, and there's no question at all that being able to really capture the, the abilities, the strengths and the interests of the patient with dementia really is critical in, in being best able to, to plan something. I think look, look, particularly for those uh, for those participants who might struggle to actually be uh, able to access the OT services, would you be able to think of any uh, any simple examples of, of interventions which our uh, participants might be able to, to use or suggest for, for carers of patients with dementia? I think that one of the good places to start is the internet. Um, it's a great wealth of information about anything from the different sorts of activities you can do with a person with dementia to techniques for communicating and then you have YouTube which brings it all together in a way that models it for you so that you can pick up things and learn new skills from that. Um, if you're looking at activities that you're wanting to use, um, some of the things that I would suggest is starting with well, what are the interests of the person and what roles have they had in the past. And what are the things that we might be able to provide now that continue those sorts of things? One of the things that happens when a person is diagnosed with dementia and continues through the dementia trajectory is that um, things that they've been interested in and active in become, uh, they, they be disengage from that or they're forcibly disengaged by people around them who see them failing at elements of a task so withdraw them from doing the entire task. And what we need to do is get cleverer at actually modifying and looking at what are the bits that the person still can do that we can continue to allow them to do or how might we actually simplify their task so that they're using skills that they have 
and we don't have to worry about them experiencing a sense of failure or being confronted with that, um, with, with their sense of failing abilities. Um, so there's lots of activities that can be done out there. Uh, repetitive activities is one that I often start with because it's often a real strength for people, as I said earlier. Those can be things like sorting, folding, tying, winding, tearing, stringing, picking, counting, singing, blowing bubbles, all of those sorts of things. Um, things that continue roles, you might think about the work role that a person has had, what work have they done and what could we give them that might um, replicate elements of that and make them feel like they're contributing or things are purposeful for them. Um, we might look at preferred music, uh, chores around the house or even if the person's in residential aged care, there are heaps of chores that can be done. Even if it's you know, wiping down the table and the staff still have to come afterwards and do it themselves, that's fine. At least it's giving them something that they're able to do and empowering in the, them in that. Um, reminiscing, uh, reminiscing about interests, reminiscing about past experiences and events, uh, physical activities, things like sleeping, raking, dancing, walking, um, and then there's the more cognitive activities. Uh, increasingly now there's access to tablet-based devices, touchscreen tablets, and they can be used with people with dementia um, into the moderate severe stages. You go from having something that is more of a cognitive-based app through to having something that's a more sensory-based app for the people that are more progressed in their dementia. And then finally, it's about setting up the environment so that these opportunities are available to the people and that does not take but you know, a moment of carer's time to do and allows the person to volitionally engage. That's fantastic, Alyssa. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, it's, it's some wonderful feedback already coming through. I think everybody's jotting those down. And, and uh, as, as was said, look, an easy place to start, obviously, is YouTube and, and the internet. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure that if, if you missed all that, grab the, grab the recording afterwards. Um, Steve, we've had a, a few pa a few participants uh, now, but also beforehand, saying what happens. You, you quite rightly pointed out about the, the distance and the the, the, uh, the geological aspects of, of barriers to care. Certainly, there are going to be some occasions where a family may choose to to bring the patient with dementia into the into their own family home. How would you uh, advise carers for, for patients with dementia who might be considering that? What would be your advice? Okay, I guess uh, in consideration of that move, and it's a very good question, uh, the, the short answer is you'd be considering something like that when the move would be of net benefit to the system. Uh, it may well be of benefit to Malcolm, it may well be of benefit to Maureen through uh, decreasing her time commitment and carer stress. What we don't know and what remains unknown at this point is the impact that it would have on her family with her husband and with uh, her adult son who's living at home. So I'd be asking them to weigh the options and certainly involve the other family members in the discussion because those are the unknowns at the moment. And when you're considering that question in relation to uh, Maureen and Malcolm, when you think about some of the sources of her stress, the travel is one, the requirement to spend extended periods of time with Dad on the weekend. All of those are robbing her of time that she uh, would like to use for, for leisure time. She's had to drop her tennis. Uh, she's not happy with the standard at which she's maintaining her own home. And that's not surprising because currently she's maintaining two homes. She's around her dad's doing the gardening and cleaning and things there as well. So it would certainly ease, uh, in many respects, Maureen's carer burden. It may also ease some of these behaviours that were flagged in the case study as well. If we do accept that the anxiety that Malcolm shows is contingent upon his cognition and the lack of ability to orient himself successfully during the day, having him in Maureen's home may well help that. There is an adult there during the day and yes, there are some complications because it's an adult child who has a learning disability but we, we are told in the case study that he's uh, intact enough, if you like, to be able to remain at home unsupervised during the day. So the implication to me is that uh, the adult son, regardless of his learning disability, is functioning at a higher level than Malcolm is. So simply being in a home where there is somebody else physically present in order to uh, help orient him 
uh, might decrease the anxiety and reassure him significantly and, and therefore stop the phone calls that Maureen's getting during the day. The other thing to weigh up in this is, you know, Maureen's struggling in maintenance of both houses. If uh, Malcolm were to move in with her, then some of the, the external supports that are currently being provided to him in his home would be able to potentially be able to be provided to him in Maureen's home if that becomes his primary residence. So they are providing direct external supports to Maureen as well. So the issue to consider is whether a move such as that would increase or decrease the demands on the system. But we need to consider the demands on Malcolm, the demands on Maureen and the demands on Maureen's family who arguably don't have any demands on them at the moment because they're not directly involved in the care process. Uh, dad, her husband's working uh, 60 hours a week and the adult son is not described as uh, having any responsibilities. So the potential for a net downside to the system might be where it impacts on uh, her own family relationships and uh, particularly those with her husband. It may be feasible for Malcolm. Uh, Maureen's obviously the favoured child, so moving in uh, with a family member. It sounds like Maureen's the only feasible alternative, but of course we don't know Malcolm's views on a move either. So it's weighing the views of the person with dementia, the carer and the net benefit to the system. Fantastic, Stephen. Thank, thanks so much. And uh, you know, these, these are, these are just, just great insights from, from everybody. Th thanks so much. And uh, not only really to our to our presenters, but uh, noticing actually that the participants yourselves uh, have actually been solving a lot of the, the questions, and it's it's fantastic to have so much interaction going on between everybody on on the chat box. And I know you're all from all across Australia, and sadly a lot of these things do depend on which state you're in for the access to the services. But uh, yeah, very very much uh, agreeing with with all the suggestions that everybody's coming up with. And uh, sorry that we can't solve all the administrative issues. It's tough enough just to get the sound coming out right, apparently. But if we can uh, just at least advise you on the places to start, then that's a, that's a good good way to go. So um, so yeah. So thank you very much to to everybody for uh, for your, your participation tonight. I would like to to ask that you all just uh, make sure that you do take the time to fill in the exit survey. Um, before we get to the uh, before you, you log out of the, of the of the program, and so once you actually click uh, close on the screen, it should pop up for you. We'll then be able to send out your attendance certificates uh, within the, the next couple of weeks as as well. And that will also have the link to the online resources which we were referring to throughout the, the presentation. MHPN would like to to remind you that we've uh, we have a series of these webinars throughout the year. The next one will be coming up in uh, just under a month on the fifth of fifth of June. That one will be on collaborative mental health care to support adults on the autism autism spectrum. So it'd be great to, to see lots of registrations for that one. You can sign up at www.mhpn.org.au forward slash upcoming webinars. And of course, the strength of MHPN's activities is that it really does bring like-minded uh, in individuals into this space where we can all learn from one another. And it, there's a great opportunity for all of us if we're part of a local network. So if it is something you think you might be like to be part of, or maybe even uh, help chair one or set one up in your area, uh, have a look at the, the, the link here and, uh, and see if there's actually one in your area. Otherwise, we could certainly uh, get in contact to, uh, to help tee one up. So on behalf of all of the uh, all of the, the the team, thank you everybody for your contribution and, and participation. As I said, uh, if you've missed any of the, the webinar tonight, you'll be able to access it through the, the recording afterwards. But other than that, good evening and goodbye. Thank you very much.